Hello everyone, we're back with our next section of Steelheart by Brandon Sanderson, read by permission of Penguin Random House. In our last read, David's plan might not have been enough to convince Megan, but it was enough to convince Prof, and David correctly figured out that that's still who he really needed to convince, despite what Prof had said. So we are moving on to part two. David is tentatively accepted as one of the Reckoners, and they are going to work after, or work at, going after Steelheart. So here we have chapter 14. Now, y'all gotta be gentle with her, Cody said, like caressing a beautiful woman the night before the big caber toss. Caber toss? I said as I raised my hands toward the chunk of steel on the chair in front of me. I sat cross-legged on the floor of the Reckoner hideout. Cody on the ground beside me, his back to the wall and legs stretched out in front of him. It had been a week since the hit on Fortuity. Yeah, caber toss, Cody said. Though his accent was purely southern, and strongly that, he always talked as if he were from Scotland. I guessed his family was from there or something. It's this sport we had back in the homeland. Involved throwing trees. Little saplings? Like like javelins? No, no. The cabers had to be so wide that your fingers couldn't touch on the other side when you reached your arms around them. We'd rip them out of the ground, then hurl them as far as we could. I raised a skeptical eyebrow. Bonus points if you could hit a bird out of the air, he added. Cody, Tia said, walking by with a sheaf of papers. Do you even know what a caber is? A tree, he said. We use them to build show houses. It's where the word cabaret came from, lass. He said it with such a straight face that I had trouble determining if he was sincere or not. You're a buffoon, Tia said, sitting down at the table, which was spread with various detailed maps that I hadn't been able to make sense of. They appeared to be city plans and schematics dating from before the annexation. Thank you, Cody said, tipping his camo baseball cap toward her. It wasn't a compliment. Oh, you didn't mean it as one, lass, Cody said. But the word buffoon, it comes from the word buff, meaning strong and handsome, which in turn... Aren't you supposed to be helping David learn the tensors? She interrupted. And not bothering me? It's all right, Cody said. I can do both. I'm a man of many talents. None of which involve remaining silent, unfortunately, Tia muttered, leaning down and making a few notations on her map. I smiled, though even after a week with them I wasn't sure what to make of the Reckoners. I'd imagined each pod of them as an elite special forces group, tightly knit and intensely loyal to one another. There was some of that in this group. Even Tia and Cody's banter was generally good-natured. However, there was also a lot of individuality to them. They each kind of uh, did their own thing. Prof didn't seem so much a leader as a middle manager. Abraham worked on the technology, Tia the research, Megan information gathering, and Cody odd jobs, filling in the spaces with mayonnaise, as he liked to call it, whatever that meant. It was bizarre to see them as people. A part of me was actually disappointed. My gods were regular humans who squabbled, laughed, got on one another's nerves, and, in Abraham's case, snored when they slept. Loudly. Now that's the right look of concentration, Cody said. Nice work, lad. Y'all have got to keep a keen mind, focused, like Sir William himself. Soul of a warrior. He took a bite of his sandwich. I hadn't been focused on my tensor, but I didn't let on to that fact. Instead, I raised my hand, doing as I'd been instructed. The thin glove I wore had lines of metal along the front of each finger. The lines joined in a pattern at the palm, and all glowed softly green. As I concentrated, my hand began to vibrate softly, as if someone was playing music with a lot of bass somewhere nearby. It was hard to focus with that strange pulsation running up my arm. I raised my hand toward the chunk of metal. It was the remnant of a section of pipe. Now, apparently, I needed to push the vibrations away from me, whatever that meant. The technology hooked right into my nerves using sensors inside the glove, interpreting electrical impulses from my brain. So Abraham had explained. Cody had said it was magic, 
and had told me not to ask any questions, lest I anger the wee demons inside who make the gloves work and our coffee taste good. I still hadn't managed to make the tensors do anything, though I felt I was getting close. I had to remain focused, keep my hands steady, and push the vibrations out. Like blowing a ring of smoke, Abraham had said or like using your body warmth in a hug without the arms. That had been Tia's explanation. Everyone thought of it their own way, I guess. My hand started to shake more vigorously. Steady, Cody said. Don't lose control, lad. I stiffened my muscles. Whoa, not too stiff, Cody said. Secure, strong, but calm. Like you're caressing a beautiful woman, remember? That made me think of Megan. I lost control, and a green wave of smoky energy burst from my hand and flew out in front of me. It missed the pipe completely, but vaporized the metal leg of the chair it sat on. Dust showered down, and the chair went lopsided, dumping the pipe to the floor with a clang. Sparks, Cody said. Remind me never to let you caress me, lad. I thought you told him to think of a beautiful woman, Tia said. Yeah, Cody replied. And if that's how he treats one of them, I don't want to know what he'd do to an ugly Scotsman. I did it, I exclaimed, pointing at the powdered metal that was the remains of the chair leg. Yeah, but you missed. It doesn't matter, I said. I finally made it work. I hesitated. It wasn't like blowing smoke. It was like, like singing from my hand. That's a new one, Cody said. It's different for everyone. Tia said from her table, head still down. She opened a can of cola as she scribbled notes. Tia was useless without her cola. Using the tensors isn't natural to your mind, David. You've already built neural pathways, and so you have to kind of hotwire your brain to figure out what mental muscles to flex. I've always wondered, if we gave a tensor to a child, if they'd be, be able to incorporate using it better, more naturally, as just another kind of limb to practice with. Cody looked at me. Then he whispered, We demons! Don't let her fool you, lad. I think she works for them. I saw her leaving out pie for them the other night. Trouble is, he was just serious enough to make me question whether he really believed that. The twinkle to his eye indicated he was being silly, but he had such a perfectly straight face. I took off the tensor and handed it over. Cody slipped it on, then absently raised a hand, palm first to the side and thrust it outward. The tensor began vibrating as his hand moved, and when it stopped, a faint smoky green wave continued on, hitting the fallen chair and the pipe. Both vaporized to dust, falling to the ground in a puff. Each time I saw the tensors work, I was amazed. The range was very limited, only a few feet at most, and they couldn't affect flesh. They weren't much good in a fight, Sure, you could vaporize someone's gun, but only if they were very close to you, in which case taking the time to concentrate and fight with the tensors would probably be less effective than just punching the guy. Still, the opportunities they afforded were incredible. Moving through the bowels of New Cago's steel catacombs, getting in and out of rooms, if you managed to keep the tensor hidden, you could escape from any bond, any cell. You keep training, Cody asked. You show talent, so Prof will want you to get good with these. We need another member of the team who can use them. Not all of you can? I asked, surprised. Cody shook his head. Megan can't make them work, and Tia's rarely in a position to use them. We need her back giving support while on missions. So it usually comes down to Abraham and me using them. What about Prof? I asked. He invented them. He's got to be pretty good with them, right? Cody shook his head. Don't know. He refuses to use them. Something about a bad experience in the past. He won't talk about it. Probably shouldn't. We don't need to know. Either way, you should practice. Cody shook his head and took off the tensor, tucking it into his pocket. What I'd have given for one of these before? The other pieces of Reckoner technology were awesome, too. The jackets, which supposedly worked a little like armor, were one. Cody, Megan, and Abraham each wore a jacket, different on the outside, but with a complicated network of diodes inside that somehow protected them. The dowser, which told if someone was epic, was another piece of such technology. 
The only other piece I'd seen was something they called the harm's way, a device that accelerated a body's healing abilities. It's so sad, I thought, as Cody fetched a broom to clean up the dust. All of this technology, it could have changed the world if the epics hadn't done that first. A ruined world couldn't enjoy the benefits. What was your life like back then? I asked, holding the dustpan for Cody. Before all of this happened, what did you do? You wouldn't believe me, Cody said, smiling. Let me guess, I said, anticipating one of Cody's stories. Professional footballer, high-paid assassin and spy. A cop, Cody said, subdued, looking down at the pile of dust, in Nashville. What? Really? Cody nodded, then waved for me to dump the first pile of dust into the trash bin while he swept up the rest of it. My father was a cop, too, in his early years, over in the homeland. Small city. You wouldn't know it. He moved here when he married my mother. I grew up over here. Ain't never actually been to the homeland. But I wanted to be just like my pa, so when he died, I went to school and joined the force. Huh, I said, stooping down again to collect the rest of the dust. That's a lot less glamorous than I'd been imagining. Well, I did take a and take down an entire drug cartel by myself, you understand. Uh, of course. And there was the time the president's secret service was shuttling, shuttling him through the city, and they all ate a bad mess of scones and got sick, and we in the department had to protect him from an assassination plot. He called over to Abraham, who was tinkering with one of the team's shotguns. It was them Frenchies who were behind it, you know. I'm not French, Abraham called back. I'm Canadian, you slonts. Same difference, Cody said, then grinned and looked back at me. Anyway, maybe it wasn't glamorous, not all the time, but I enjoyed it. I liked doing good for people, serve and protect. And then, then, I asked, Nashville got annexed when the country collapsed, Cody explained. A group of five epics took charge of most of the South. The Coven, I said, nodding. There's actually six of them, one pair of twins. Ah, right. Keep forgetting that y'all are freakishly informed about this stuff. Anyway, they took over and the police department started serving them. We didn't agree. We were supposed to turn in our badges and retire. The good ones did that. The bad ones stayed on and they got worse. And you? I asked. Cody fingered the thing he kept at his waist, tied to his belt on the right side. It looked like a thin wallet. He reached down and undid the snap, showing a scratched but still polished police badge. I didn't do either one, he said, subdued. I took an oath. Serve and protect. I ain't going to stop that because some thugs with magic powers start shoving everybody around. That's that. His words gave me a chill. I stared at that badge, and my mind flipped over and over like a pancake on a griddle, trying to figure out this man, trying to reconcile the joking, storytelling blowhard with the image of a police officer still on his beat, still serving after the city government had fallen, after the precinct had been shut down, after everything had been taken from him. The others probably have similar stories, I thought, glancing at Tia, who was busy working away, sipping her cola. What had drawn her to fighting what most would call a hopeless battle? Living a life of constant running? Bringing justice to those the law should have condemned but would not touch? What had drawn Abraham, Megan, the professor himself? I looked back at Cody, who was moving to close his badge holder. There was something tucked behind the plastic opposite in the holder. A picture of a woman, but with a section removed a bar shape that had contained her eyes and much of her nose. Who was that? Somebody special, Cody said. Who? He didn't answer, snapping the badge holder closed. It's better if we don't know or ask about each other's families, Tia said from the table. Usually a stent in the Reckoners ends with death, but occasionally one of us gets captured. Better if we can't reveal anything about the others that will put their loved ones in danger. Oh, I said. Yeah, that makes sense. It just wasn't something I'd have considered. I didn't have any loved ones left. 
How's it going there, lass? Cody asked, sauntering over to the table. I joined him and saw that Tia had spread out lists of reports and ledgers. It's not going at all, Tia said with a grimace. She rubbed her eyes beneath her spectacles. This is like trying to recreate a compl complex puzzle after being given only one piece. What are you doing? I asked. I couldn't make sense of the ledgers any more than I'd been able to make sense of the maps. Steelheart was wounded that day, Tia said. If your recollection is correct, it is, I promised. People's memories fade, Cody said. Not mine, I said. Not about this. Not about that day. I can tell you what color tie the mortgage man was wearing. I can tell you how many tellers there were. I could probably count the ceiling tiles in the bank for you. It's there, in my head, burned there. All right, Tia said. Well, if you are correct, then Steelheart was impervious for most of the fight and only harmed near the end. Something changed. I'm working through all possibilities. Something about your father, the location, or the situation. The most likely seems the possibility you mentioned, that the vault was involved. Perhaps something inside it weakened Steelheart, and once the vault was blown open, it could affect him. So you're looking for a record of the bank vault's contents? Yes, Tia said, but it's an impossible task. Most of the records would have been destroyed with the bank. Off-site records would have been stored on a server somewhere. First Union was hosted by a company known as Dory Jones LLC. Most of their servers were located in Texas, but the building was burned down eight years back during the Ardra riots. That leaves the off chance that they had physical records or a digital backup at another branch, but that building housed the main offices, so the chances of that are slim. Other than that, I've been looking for patron lists, the rich or notable who were known to frequent the bank and have boxes in the vault. Perhaps they stored something in there that will be part of the public record. A strange rock, a specific symbol that Steelheart might have seen, something. I looked at Cody. Servers? Hosted? What was she talking about? He shrugged. The problem was, an epic weakness could be just about anything. Tia mentioned symbols. There were some epics who, if they saw a specific pattern, lost their powers for a few moments. Others were weakened by thinking certain thoughts, not eating certain foods, or eating the wrong foods. The weaknesses were more varied than the powers themselves. If we don't figure out this puzzle, Tia said, the rest of the plan is useless. We're starting down a dangerous path, but we don't yet know if we'll be capable of doing what we need to at the end. That bothers me greatly, David. If you think of anything, anything that could give me another lead to work on, speak of it. I will, I promised. Good, she said. Otherwise, take Cody and please let me concentrate. You really should learn to do two things at once, lass, Cody said. Like me. It's easy to both be a buffoon and make messes of things, Cody, she replied. Putting those messes back together while dealing with said buffoon is a much more difficult prospect. Go find something to shoot, or whatever it is you do. I thought I was doing whatever it is I do, he said absently. He stabbed a finger at a line on one of the pages, which looked like it listed clients of the bank. It read, Johnson Liberty Agency. What are you... Tia began, then cut herself off as she read the words. What? I asked, reading the document. Are those people who stored things at the bank? No, Tia said. This isn't a list of clients. It's a list of the people the bank was paying. That's the name of their insurance company, Cody said, smirking. Calamity, Cody, Tia swore. I hate you. I know you do, lass. Oddly, both of them were smiling as they said it. Tia immediately began shuffling through papers, though she noticed, with a dry look, that Cody had left a smudged bit of mayonnaise from his sandwich on the paper where he'd pointed. He took me by the shoulder and steered me away from the table. What just happened? I asked. Insurance company, Cody said. The people who First Union Bank paid piles of money to to cover the stuff they had in their vault. So that insurance company would have kept a detailed day-by-day -day record of just what they were insuring, Cody said with a grin. 
Insurance people are a wee bit anal about things like that. Like bankers. Like Tia, actually. If we're lucky, the bank filed an insurance claim following the loss of the building. That would leave an additional paper trail. Clever, I said, impressed. Oh, I'm just good at finding things that are hovering around under my nose. I have keen eyes. I once caught a leprechaun, leprechaun you know. I looked at him skeptically. Aren't those Irish? Sure, he was over in the homeland on an exchange basis. We sent the Irish three turnips and a sheep's bladder in trade. Doesn't seem like much of a trade. Oh, I think it was a sparkin' good one, seeing as to how leprechauns are imaginary and all. Hello, Prof. How's your kilt? As imaginary as your leprechaun, Cody, Prof said, walking into the chamber from one of the side rooms, the one he'd appropriated as his thinking room, whatever that meant. It was the one with the imager in it, and the other reckoners stayed away from it. Can I borrow David? Please, Prof, Cody said. We're friends. You should know by now that you mustn't needn't ask for something like that. You should be well aware of my standard charge for renting one of my minions. Three pounds and a bottle of whiskey. I wasn't sure if I should be more insulted at being called a minion, or at the low price to rent me. Prof ignored him, taking me by the arm. I'm sending Abraham and Megan to Diamond's place today. The weapons dealer? I asked, eager. They'd mentioned that he might have some technology for sale that could help the Reckoners pretend to be an epic. The powers manifested would have to be flashy and destructive to get Steelheart's attention. I want you to tag along. It will be good experience for you, Prof said. But follow orders. Abraham is in charge. And let me know if anyone you meet seems to recognize you. I will. Go get your gun, then. They're leaving soon. Chapter 15 What about the gun? Abraham said as we walked. The bank, the vault contents, those could be a false lead, could they not? What if there was something special about the gun your father fired at him? That gun was dropped by a random security officer, I said. Smith & Wesson M&P 9mm, semi-auto. There was nothing special about it. You remember the exact gun? I kicked a bit of trash as we walked through the steel-walled underground tunnel. As I said, I remember that day. Besides, I know guns. I hesitated, then admitted more. When I was young, I assumed the type of gun must have been special. I saved up, planning to buy one, but nobody would sell to a kid my age. I was planning to sneak into the palace and shoot him. Sneak into the palace, Abraham said flatly. Um, yes? And shoot Steelheart. I was ten, I said. Give me a little credit. To a boy with aspirations like that, I would extend my respect, but not credit or life insurance. Abraham sounded amused. You are an interesting man, David Charleston. But you sound like you were an even more interesting child. I smiled. There was something invitingly friendly about this soft-spoken, articulate Canadian with his French accent. You almost didn't notice the enormous machine gun with mounted grenade launcher resting on his shoulder. We were still in the steel catacombs, where even such a high level of armament didn't draw particular attention. We passed occasional groups of people huddling around burning fires, or heaters plugged into pirated electrical jacks. More than a few of the people we passed carried assault rifles. Over the last few days, I'd ventured out of the hideout a couple of times, always in the company of one of the other Reckoners. The babysitting bothered me, but I got it. I couldn't exactly hope for them to trust me yet. Not completely. Besides, though I would never admit it out loud, I didn't want to walk the steel catacombs alone. I'd avoided these depths for years, at the factory, they told stories about the depraved people, terrible monsters who lived down here. Gangs that literally fed on the foolish who wandered into forgotten hallways, killing them and feasting on their flesh. Murderers, criminals, addicts. Not the normal sort of criminals and addicts we had up above, either. Especially depraved ones. Perhaps those were exaggerations. The people we passed did seem dangerous, but more in a hostile way, not in an insane way. 
They watched with grim expressions and eyes that tracked your every movement until you passed out of their view. These people wanted to be alone. They were the outcasts of the outcasts. Why does he let them live down here? I asked as we passed another group. Megan didn't respond. She was walking ahead of us, keeping to herself, but Abraham glanced over his shoulder, looking toward the firelight and the line of people who had stepped up to make sure we left. There will always be people like them, Abraham said. Steelheart knows it. Tia, she thinks he made this place for them so he would know where they were. It is useful to know where your outcasts are gathering. Better the ones you know about than the ones you cannot anticipate. That made me uncomfortable. I'd thought we were completely outside Steelheart's view down here. Perhaps this place wasn't as safe as I'd assumed. You cannot keep all men confined all the time, Abraham said, not without creating a strong prison. So instead, you allow some measure of freedom for those who really, really want it. That way, they do not become rebels if you do it right. He did it wrong with us, I said softly. Yes, uh, yes, indeed, I did. I kept glancing back as I walked. I couldn't shake the worry that some of those in the catacombs would attack us. They never did, though. They... I started as I realized that at that moment some of them were following us. Abraham, I said softly, they're following. Yes, he said calmly. There are some waiting for us ahead, too. In front of us, the tunnel narrowed. Sure enough, a group of shadowed figures were standing there waiting. They wore the mismatched cast-off clothing, common to many catacombers, and they carried old rifles and pistols wrapped in leather, the type of guns that probably only worked one day out of two and had been carried by a dozen different people over the last ten years. The three of us stopped walking, and the group behind caught up, boxing us in. I couldn't see their faces. None carried mobiles, and it was dark without their glow. That's some nice equipment, friend, said one of the figures in the group in front of us. Nobody made any overtly hostile moves. They held their weapons with barrels pointed to the sides. I carefully started to unsling my gun, my heart racing. Abraham, however, laid a hand on my shoulder. He carried his massive machine gun in his other hand. Barrel pointed upward and wore one of the Reckoner jackets, like Megan, though his was gray and white, with a high collar and several pockets, while hers was standard brown leather. They always wore their jackets when they left the hideout. I'd never seen one work, and I didn't know how much protection they could realistically offer. Be still, Abraham said to me, but I will deal with this, he said his voice perfectly calm as he took a step forward. Megan stepped up beside me, hand on the holster of her pistol. She didn't look any calmer than I was, both of us trying to watch the people ahead and behind us at once. You uh, like our equipment? Abraham asked politely. You should leave the guns, the thug said. Continue on. This would not make any sense, Abraham said. If I have weapons that you want, the implication is that my firepower is greater than yours. If we were to fight, you would lose. You see, your intimidation, it uh, does not work. There are more of us than you, friend, the guy said softly, and we're ready to die. Are you? I felt a chill at the back of my neck. No, these weren't the murderers I'd been led to believe lived down here. They were something more dangerous, like a pack of wolves. I could see it in them now, in the way they moved, in the way groups of them had watched us pass. These were outcasts, but outcasts who had bound, banded together to become one. They no longer lived as individuals, but as a group. And for this group, guns like the ones Abraham and Megan carried would increase their chances of survival. They'd take them, even if it meant losing some of their members. It looked to be about a dozen men and women against just three, and we were surrounded. They were terrible odds. I itched to lower my rifle and start shooting. You, uh, you didn't ambush us, Abraham pointed out. 
you hope to be able to end this without death? The thieves didn't reply. It is uh, very kind of you to offer us this chance, Abraham said, nodding to them. There was a strange sincerity to Abraham. From another person, words like those might have sounded condescending or sarcastic, but from him, they sounded genuine. You have uh, let us pass several times through territory you consider to be your own. For this also I give you my thanks. The guns, the thug said. I cannot give them to you, Abraham said. We need them. Beyond this, if we were to give them to you, it would go poorly for you and yours. Others would seize them and would desire them. Other gangs would seek to take them from you, as you have sought to take them from us. That isn't for you to decide. Perhaps not. However, in respect of the honor you have shown us, I will offer you a duel. Between you and me, only one man need be shot. If we win, you will leave us be and allow us to pass freely through this area in the future. If you win, my friends will deliver up their weapons and you may take from my body that which you wish. These are the steel catacombs, the man said. Some of his companions were whispering now and he glared at them with shadowed eyes then continued, this is not a place of deals. And yet uh, you already offered us one, Abraham said calmly. You did us honor. I trust you will show it to us again. It didn't seem to be about honor to me. They hadn't ambushed us because they were afraid of us. They wanted the weapons, but they didn't want a fight. They aimed to intimidate us instead. The lead thug, however, finally nodded. nodded. Fine, he said. A deal. Then he quickly raised his rifle and fired. The bullet hit Abraham right in the chest. I jumped cursing as I scrambled for my gun. But Abraham didn't fall. He didn't even twitch. Two more shots cracked out in the narrow tunnel, bullets hitting him, one in the leg, one in the shoulder. Ignoring his powerful machine gun, he calmly reached to his side and took his handgun out of its holster, then shot the thug in the thigh. The man cried out, dropping his battered rifle and collapsing, holding his wounded leg. Most of the others seemed too shocked to respond though a few lowered their weapons nervously. Abraham casually reholstered his pistol. I felt sweat trickle down my brow. The jacket seemed to be doing its job and doing it better than I'd assumed. But I didn't have one of those yet. If the other thugs opened fire... Abraham handed his machine gun to Megan, then walked forward and knelt beside the fallen thug. Place pressure here, please, he said in a friendly tone, positioning the man's hand on his thigh. There. Very good. Now, if you don't mind, I'll bandage the wound. I shot you where the bullet could pass through the muscle, so it wouldn't get lodged inside. The thug groaned at the pain as Abraham took out a bandage and wrapped the leg. You cannot kill us, friend, Abraham continued, speaking more softly. We are not what you sought us to be. Do you understand? The thug nodded vigorously. It would be wise to be our allies, do you not think? Yes, the thug said. Wonderful, Abraham replied, tying the bandage tight. Change that twice a day. Use boiled bandages. Yes. Good. Abraham stood and took his gun back and turned to the rest of the thug's group. Thank you for letting us pass, he said to the others. They looked confused, but parted, creating a path for us. Abraham walked forward and we followed in a hurry. I looked over my shoulder as the rest of the gang gathered around their fallen leader. That was amazing, I said as we got farther away. No, it was a group of frightened people defending what little they can lay claim to. Their reputation. I feel bad for them. They shot you three times. I gave them permission. Only after they threatened us only after we violated their territory, Abraham said. He handed his machine gun to Megan again, then took off his jacket as he walked. I could see that one of the bullets had penetrated it. Blood was seeping out around a hole in his shirt. The jacket didn't stop them all? They aren't perfect, Megan said as Abraham took off the shirt. Mine fails all the time. 
We stopped as Abraham cleaned the wound with a hand handkerchief, and then pulled out a little shard of metal. It was all that was left of the bullet, which had apparently disintegrated upon hitting his jacket. Only one little shard had made it through to his skin. What if he'd shot you in the face? I asked. Is a jacket's hide an advanced shielding device? Abraham said. It isn't the jacket itself that protects, really, but the field the jacket extends. It offers uh, some protection for the entire body, an invisible barrier to resist force. What? Really? That's amazing. Yes. Abraham hesitated, then pulled his shirt back on. It probably would not have stopped a bullet to the face, however, so I am fortunate they did not choose to shoot me there. As I said, Megan interjected, they're far from perfect. She seemed annoyed with Abraham. The shield works better with things like falls and crashes. Bullets are so small and hit with so much velocity, the shields overload quickly. Any one of those shots could have killed you, Abraham. But they did not. You still could have been hurt. I was hurt. She rolled her eyes. You could have been hurt worse. Or they could have opened fire and killed us, killed us all, he said. It was a gamble that worked. Besides, I believe they now think we are epics. I almost thought you were one, I admitted. Normally we keep this technology hidden. Abraham said, putting on his jacket again. People cannot wonder whether the Reckoners are epics. It would undermine what we stand for. However, in this case, I believe it will go well for us. Your plan calls for it to be rumors of new epics in the city working against Steelheart. These men will hopefully spread that rumor. I, I guess, I said. It was a good move, Abraham. But Sparks, for a moment I thought we were dead. People rarely want to kill, David, Abraham said calmly. It's not basic to the makeup of the healthy human mind. In most situations, they will go to great lengths to avoid killing. Remember that, and it will help you. I've seen a lot of people kill, I replied. Yes, and that will tell you something. Either they felt they had no choice, in which, if you could give them another choice, they would likely have taken it, or they were not of healthy mind. And epics? Abraham reached to his neck and fingered the small silver necklace he wore there. Epics are not human. I nodded. With that, I agreed. I believe our conversation was interrupted, Abraham said, taking his gun from Megan and casually resting it on his shoulder as we walked onward. How did Steelheart get wounded? It could have been the weapon your father used. You never tried your brave brave plan of finding an identical gun, then doing, uh, what was it you shared, said? Sneaking into Steelheart's palace and shooting him? No, I didn't try to get it, I said, blushing. I came to my senses. I don't think it was the gun, though. M&P 9mm aren't exactly uncommon. Someone's got to have tried shooting him with one. Besides, I've never heard of an epic whose weakness was being shot by a specific caliber of bullet or make of gun. Perhaps, Abraham said, but many epic weaknesses do not make sense. It could have, could have something to do with that specific gun manufacturer, or instead it could have something to do with the composition of the bullets. Many epics are weak to specific alloys. True, I admitted, but what would be different about that particular bullet that wasn't the same for all of the others fired at him? I don't know, Abraham said, but it is worth considering. What do you think caused his weakness? Something in the vault, like Tia thinks, I said with only some measure of confidence. Either that or something about the situation. Maybe my father's specific age let him get through. Weird, I know. But there was an epic in Germany who could only be hurt by someone who was 37 exactly. Or maybe it was the number of people firing on him. Crossmark, an epic down in Mexico, can only be hurt if five people are trying to kill her at once. It doesn't matter, Megan interrupted, turning around in the hallway and stopping in the tunnel to look at us. You're never going to figure it out. His weakness could be virtually anything. Even with David's little story... 
assuming he didn't just make it up. There's no way of knowing. Abraham and I stopped in place. Megan's face was red and she seemed barely in control. After a week of her acting cold and professional, her anger was a big shock. She spun around and kept walking. I glanced at Abraham and he shrugged. We continued on, but our conversation died. Megan quickened her pace when Abraham tried to catch up to her, and so we just left her to it. Both she and Abraham had been given directions to the weapons merchant, so she could guide us just as well as he could. Apparently, this diamond fellow was only going to be in town for a short time, and when he came, he always set up shop in a different location. We walked for a good hour through the twisting maze of catacombs before Megan stopped us at an intersection, her mobile illuminating her face as she checked the map Tia had uploaded to it. Abraham took his mobile off the shoulder of his jacket and did the same. Almost there, he told me, pointing. This way, at the end of this tunnel. How well do we trust this guy, I asked. Not at all, Megan said. Her face had returned to its normal, impassive mask. Abraham nodded. Best to never trust a weapons merchant, my friend. They all sell to both sides, and they are the only ones who win if a conflict continues indefinitely. Both sides? I asked. He sells to Steelheart, too? He won't admit, if you ask, Abraham said. But it is certain that he does. Even Steelheart knows not to harm a good weapons dealer. Kill or torture a man like Diamond and future merchants won't come here. Steelheart's army will never have good technology compared to the neighbors. That's not saying that Steelheart likes it. Diamond, he could never open his shop up in the overstreets. Down here, however, Steelheart will turn a blind eye so long as his soldiers continue to get their equipment. So... Whatever we buy from him, I said. Steelheart will know about it? No, no, Abraham said. He seemed amused, as if I were asking some questions about something incredibly simple, like the rules to hide and seek. Weapons merchants don't talk about other clients, Megan said. As long as those clients live, at least. Diamond arrived back in the city just yesterday, Abraham said leading the way down the tunnel. He'll, he will be open for one week's time. If we are first to get it, if we are first to get to him, we can see what he has before Steelheart's people do. We can get an advantage this way, eh? Diamond, he often has very interesting wares. All right then, I thought. I guess it didn't matter that Diamond was slime. I'd use any tool I could to get to Steelheart. Moral considerations had stopped bothering me years ago. Who had time for morals in a world like this? We reached the corridor leading to Diamond's shop. I expected guards, perhaps in full-powered armor. The only person there, though, was a young girl in a yellow dress. She was lying on a blanket on the floor and drawing pictures on a piece of paper with a silver pen. She looked up at us and began chewing on the end of her pen. Abraham politely handed the girl a small data chip, which she took and examined for a moment before tapping it on the side of her mobile. We are with Fedris, Abraham said. We have an appointment. Go on, the girl answered, tossing the chip back to him. Abraham snatched it from the air and we continued down the corridor. I glanced over my shoulder at the girl. That's not very strong security. It's uh, always something new with Diamond, Abraham said, smiling. There's probably something elaborate behind the scenes, some kind of trap the girl can spring. It probably has to do with explosives. Diamond likes explosives. We turned a corner and stepped into heaven. Here we are. Here we are, Abraham announced. That is the end of chapter 15. We'll be back with another section next time.